I'm sure many of you will have noticed Brett's back with us. Brett, we love you. Quite a while ago, Brett pointed out that I'd made a mistake in one of the episodes. I thanked him and redid the episode. He recently pointed out a mistake in episode 92, which deals with stellar parallax. I thought of redoing it, but in considering the episode, that error made no difference to any of the conclusions. So I want to make a suitable apology and put a link into 92. I am indeed sorry for the unacceptable assumption I made and I offer Brett heartfelt thanks for pointing out my error. The error was the telescope that gave 10 milliarc second parallax for Polaris. I came to the conclusion a long time ago that astronomy is on the wrong track. As I pointed out in episodes 74, 75, 84, 89 and others. Its entire model of the universe is wrong, so it's not something I take very seriously these days, but I should have been a lot more careful. When I read that 10 milliarc seconds was the advocated value for the parallax of Polaris, I assumed this must be recent satellite measurement. I knew that Gaia had been launched in 2013 that it was reputed to be more accurate than anything that had gone before, and that it was expected to give very reliable parallax values. So I assumed that was where the value came from. But I was wrong. Brett pointed out that the value actually came from a Russian ground-based telescope called the Large Azimuth Telescope. I was very surprised. For years, the establishment has been telling us that Earth-based telescopes are not good for measuring parallax. There are two main reasons. Firstly, the corrections for atmospheric distortion are much greater than the parallax they're trying to measure. Secondly, the large size and weight of the mirror causes distortions as it's turned towards a target. Satellite telescopes have no atmosphere to contend with and almost no gravity to distort the mirror. The large azimuth telescope is in the Caucasus. The atmosphere there usually needs corrections of about one arc second. The parallax they were looking for was only 0.01 arc second. There'd been several attempts to make a satisfactory mirror for this telescope, but a new mirror, installed in 2018, turned out to be worse than the previous one. So they went back to the old mirror, which is almost certainly the one used for the advocated parallax of 10 milliarc seconds. So why on earth was this the advocated value? Well... Whatever the reason, I certainly do need to correct the table of results from episode 92. The baseline for the LAT observations is far smaller than for Gaia, and is just an estimate like the one for Hipparchus. It doesn't alter the fact that the difference between the stated parallax values is 60%, but it does cut down the possible differences which the orbits of the satellite could make to the parallax if the Earth is assumed to be going round the Sun. Even Hipparchus's wildly elliptic orbit could only make a difference of about 0.01%. So, my conclusion remains the same. The parallax stories are as doubtful as all the other stories which the astronomers have been telling us, as we saw in episodes 84 and 89. But there was a very good question which Brett brought up in the chat. Is it possible for an atheist to do science following the scientific method? Now that takes more than just a comment in the chat to deal with. The scientific method put forward by Francis Bacon in his new method of science published in 1620 was founded on his Nature carries the stamp of the creator, 
whereas man's reason carries the stamp of his own folly. The proto-science of that time was based squarely on the reasoning of man. Aristotle's physics, for example, had been accepted for 2,000 years. It seemed so reasonable that it must be true. But when the scientific method was applied, it was found to be completely wrong, as we saw in episode one. Bacon's reasoning was based on the answer to the fundamental question of life. Why is there something instead of nothing? There are only two possible answers. Either the creation was created by a creator, or the creation created itself. At that time, the civilised Western world believed in the creator featured in the Bible. Bacon's science was a Christian endeavour. The scientific method proved to be a powerful tool for discovering the secrets of nature. It led to many inventions and innovations. But a swell of opposition to Christianity and the Bible started rising in the early 1800s. That opposition rapidly multiplied and atheism became a powerful movement which led to communism, the world's first culture based on atheism. Atheists could see that the scientific method worked, but there was nothing in their worldview to justify it. The method assumes that the creation is a finished work. A scientist's job is to discover the laws governing the creation. But an atheist can't accept that. An atheist has to accept the other possibility for the great question of life. He must accept that the creation created itself. And to accept that, he can't be what Richard Dawkins called an intellectually fulfilled atheist unless he can demonstrate how the creation created itself. Yet one of the primary universal laws discovered by Bacon's science was the first law of thermodynamics. Matter, energy, can neither be created nor destroyed. And the most fundamental law of science, the second law of thermodynamics, guarantees that without input of intelligence or information, systems become disordered and information never appears by itself. The creation, and its living organisms in particular, are filled with vast amounts of extremely complex information. Now, these observations and these fundamental laws pose no problem to Bacon's scientific method. The creation is a finished work, made at some specific time in the past, by an intelligent creator. According to the scientific method, any hypothesis which is not based on observation and measurement is not a scientific hypothesis. And if it is refuted by observation and measurement, it must be abandoned. But atheists can't accept that. Enormous levels of information-driven complexity are found in every living organism. Not one experiment has given any clue as to where this information could come from without input from intelligence. But an atheist can't give up the idea of evolution, from atoms to simple life, and from simple life to complex life, despite the total lack of evidence for how astoundingly complex information could arise all by itself. Nobel Prize winner George Wald admitted, there are only two possibilities as to how life arose. One is spontaneous generation arising to evolution. The other is a supernatural creative act of God. There is no third possibility. Spontaneous generation that life arose from non-living matter was scientifically disproved 120 years ago by Louis Pasteur and others. 
That leaves us with the only possible conclusion that life arose as a supernatural creative act of God. I will not accept that philosophically because I do not want to believe in God. Therefore, I choose to believe in that which I know is scientifically impossible. Spontaneous generation arising to evolution. And since evolution from atoms to simple life and evolution from simple to complex is never observed, there is no alternative but to believe the process must have been going on for a vast age of time, so slowly that we never see it happening. And that means the universe must have been around for vast ages of time. At a conference a few years ago, I spent the gala dinner in the company of a geology lecturer from a university where I used to teach. I asked him what he thought of the findings reported by Mary Schweitzer and other paleontologists. Unfossilized dinosaurs found with soft tissue containing blood vessels still containing blood cells. He said, they show that the time scale is much shorter than we thought. I asked if he told his students that. He admitted that he did not tell the students. To do so would, of course, be asking to be fired and blacklisted. So it doesn't matter that evidence for vastly shorter time scales is abundant, but it can't be admitted. And perhaps the most striking case of the establishment's intolerance of truth is Fred Hoyle. When I was a student, Hoyle was one of the great scientific heroes of myself and many of my friends. We were all atheists, and so was he. We admired his skillful dismissal of Christianity. But in each of the fields in which he did outstanding research, he came to realize that what he was studying could not have happened by chance. And he didn't keep quiet, as the geologist I mentioned above did. Hoyle openly proclaimed that evolution was nonsense of a high order, that the creation of the universe required an intelligence, and that in every field of his research it was clear that a super-intellect had been involved. Hoyle was hounded out of academia. So coming back to Brett's question, I would say it would be possible for an atheist to apply the scientific method to an investigation which accepts that nature is what it is without questioning why it is as it is and without being concerned by the fact that he must not venture into the fields which prove why nature is what it is, because if he does, he'll reach the stage that Hoyle reached and be rejected by the establishment. Or he'll reach the stage that my geologist friend reached, where he will have to keep his conclusions hidden away or face rejection. Or he'll reach the stage George Wald reached, and simply turn his back on the truth because that's not what he or the establishment wants to believe. Then he'll have to go without intellectual fulfilment and eventually acknowledge to himself that he's a fraud. Secular science has to reject the scientific method and enforce the best in the field instead. Any theory with the status of a paradigm may not be rejected or even questioned until an alternative acceptable to the establishment has been accepted. So this secular science sham hides the truth and perpetuates untruth. But we shouldn't forget the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. In John 8.32, Jesus said, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. 
And 3 John 1 verse 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.